Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, very interesting uh, session so far. Uh, I can uh, share this with you in between John and myself, Georgia Tech Cyber and UIBS. In the last 15 years, uh, we have organized probably 100 programs. And this is the topic where we had to think really, really very hard. You know, in terms of uh, uh, right from day one, there was some reservation from Dr. Shet also in terms of how do we position uh, this topic. Uh, so I'm glad that this is off the ground now and uh, we are uh, probably going to have a second version of second edition of this next year in second quarter or so with a little bit more preparation, uh, Dr. Shet. Uh, with this, uh, it's my distinct honor to invite my friend uh, Ravi Venkateshan and Nina Woodward, Woodard uh, for second session of the program. I think we are doing fine on time, except for maybe about three minutes late. Uh, and I will share with you their bios to uh, sort of catch up a little bit here. Uh, Ravi is CEO of Cantaloupe Inc. Uh, he's Atlanta-based uh, executive, uh, regular public speaker on leadership, technology, wellness topics, and also a public speaking coach. He's passionate about applying uh, mindfulness and meditative practices to improve workplace relationships and productivity. He has conducted several leadership and wellness programs for multiple companies. Ravi is also a regular panelist and speaker at events including Supernova Atlanta, Tag CIO Roundtables, and events by Georgia CIO Leadership. Thank you, Ravi. We really appreciate your participation and support. Uh, I'm also going to introduce now uh, Ms. Nina Woodard. Uh, Nina is uh, President C Chief Insight Officer for her own uh, consulting company, Nina E. Woodard and Associates. She launched this company upon her return to the U.S. at the end of uh, 2008. She has uh, extensive experience of about 35 years, 32 years uh, in the field of banking, education, and also has been involved with SHRM uh, quite a lot. Nina and I go back uh, several, several years. Uh, we have met a couple of times in India, and this is her uh, participation for the first time in the program. Uh, Nina, welcome to the program. And I also take this time to briefly introduce my colleague and our uh, technologies uh, supporter program and also associate director for Georgia Tech Cyber, Jim Hoadley. Jim and I have uh, very extensively worked in uh, bringing all these programs, and I really appreciate all the help uh, Jim has given. Uh, so with this, uh, Ravi, I would uh, allow you to share your thoughts on the topic we have been dealing with, you know, the rise of Indians uh, in sea level positions. Yeah, first of all, uh, thanks everyone for inviting me. It's always uh, uh, a pleasure to have an opportunity to listen to Dr. Jagdish said. It's it's wonderful to see you, sir. And uh, uh, you know the 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 panelists were amazing. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, every story and every perspective just brought to life uh, uh, a new aspect and a new angle. Um, as Ani mentioned, I uh, I lead a company called Cantaloupe Inc. We are we are public. We are on the Nasdaq, and uh, we lead the market for self service uh, technology uh, in payments and point of sale. So anything parking, laundry, vending, uh, you know, kiosk based marketplaces that you see at an airport or whatever, we we lead that market in North America and um, are a new player in Europe and Latin America. So that's kind of the the day job in our business. As Ani also mentioned, I'm very passionate about meditative practices and how they can help. Uh, I've been a, a meditator myself and an instructor for 30 years now and uh, practice something called heartfulness meditation. Many of you are familiar uh, with the organization and have met our global guide, uh, Sri Kamlesh Patel, who uh, is an inspiration for me also as an entrepreneur and a CEO, not just in terms of this. So... You know, when I reflect on this topic, I kind of go back to uh, two things. One is roots of immigration of Indians, and I look at it in multiple countries. And it's actually a very, um, very interesting pattern. You know, if you go back all the way, the first immigration that happened out of India was not voluntary. It was actually forced. It was indentured labor that the colonists, the British, um, essentially executed on. And that's how people landed up in Mauritius and the Caribbean and uh, you know, in several parts of the world. And some of the heads of state that we talk about in the Caribbean countries are descended from those 
indentured laborers, right? Three generations back. So that's that's like the first generation of immigration that started happening. Otherwise, people were not migrating out of India because it had the highest GDP in the world. It was very prosperous. You know, it was tropical. You could throw a seed anywhere and it grew into a beautiful tree with a lot of fruit, unlike other parts of the world. So people didn't, they weren't motivated to leave. And that's another reason India never went around conquering any other countries, whereas you had multiple generations of uh, conquerors come into India. So the reason I paint the picture of that context is you fast forward a little bit to kind of the early 19th century, and you had people from Punjab who ended up in Canada, essentially to farm. Those were the first immigrants. They weren't technology, they weren't doctors, they weren't highly educated, they were farmers. And honestly, they were they faced racism, they were persecuted, they came down to California, they, they married Mexicans because they couldn't bring their wives and they couldn't marry local people. So you, you go through that pattern. It's not been a straight line of, you know, you had a bunch of people that went to the IITs and came here and they're all successful. Some of the people that are now super successful are descended from those people that came in. Much as we are talking about people coming in from Honduras and Mexico today and working blue collar jobs. So I, I want to make sure that's not lost, that there is a generational aspect to it. And this has not been, uh, you know, the current trend is not necessarily what's been there earlier. After 65, as Dr. Devesh pointed out, you know, you had a generation of accountants come in. That was really, interestingly, the first uh, wave from India to the US in particular, but also other parts of the world because there was a shortage. And some of that led to the whole perception that Indians are good at finance. And I, I'll keep coming back to this, uh, this theme of perception, because I think a lot of success has to do with the capabilities somebody brings to the table, but also how they are accepted. You know, that really is what a glass ceiling is. It's the opposite of being accepted. So the perception shifted because of the accountants coming in around, okay, Indians are good at finance, they're good at math, right? And so that paved the path for many Indians to start choosing careers in finance and succeeding. And, you know, then you had a Vikram Shet and you had a, like you had people who could rise to the very top in the finance world. Then you had, of course, medical professionals come in, which was the next wave, right? To the 80s and um, early 90s, again, driven by a shortage of doctors, in this country, but also in the UK and you know many parts of the world, right? So, so your accountants come in, your doctors come in. Now, accountants, as they pivot into finance, could rise to high levels in the corporate world, but still far fewer, right? In terms of just sheer density, doctors, you know, yeah, they may start their own practice, their own clinic, maybe they join a hospital system and make it to a higher level. But again, not a path that leads to corporate C-level roles. That really opened up with technology, right? In the 90s. 90s is when the technology immigration started happening. And the other nuance there, which many people miss is, we think people came from India, but they didn't come from India. They came from very specific parts of India. And a majority of them actually came from one single state in India called Andhra Pradesh, which is now two states, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. So the interesting thing is the tech migration was actually disproportionately one state from India, which seized the opportunity with a forward thinking chief minister, equivalent of a governor that drove that immigration, right? So th this was, there's a whole story around how that happened and drove a trend. And then, you know, a couple of other South Indian states started joining the party. And then you had a few people come from other parts of uh, the country as well, but they were more the exception than the rule. So, so the other interesting thing here is it was an immigration from the south of India, and the south of India was always more focused on higher education. Just culturally, parents are maniacal about making sure their kids go to school, go to college, go to graduate school, right? So, and that's not the trend in the north of India. So. It, 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 it's not a, a uniform, consistent uh, kind of theme, right? So this happened. Now you had people coming in who were qualified, educated, and in a field like technology, which was relatively new. So there wasn't an established cohort of kind of leadership there already, like say 
oil or you know petrochemicals or manufacturing or um, you know I can I can go on and on in terms of industries right uh, textiles or whatever so you had this field that was already emerging so lacked and pre a pre-existing cohort of smart people that were leaders there and now you had this immigrant population that was taking on the lower jobs initially but soon distinguishing themselves right and so you could have an Indian rise up to be a director, a VP, a CIO, a CTO, and that started becoming more and more common. And then, you know, it was just a matter of time that you had some people who broke that other glass ceiling and got to the CEO levels as they proved themselves just by law of averages to some extent. The other interesting thing that happened in parallel was you know, there, there was a choice being made in terms of the perception. I still remember, and I've only been here 22 years, relatively short time, but I remember where the perception was that as an Indian, you were already accepted. You didn't have to prove yourself as you're going to be smart as a technologist, as a programmer, as a, uh, you know, somebody who builds systems, et cetera. You're going to be smart at finance, et cetera. But your skills around strategy and management and business models and establishing new markets was not readily accepted at that time. Today, when I have conversations with people, they're actually seeking out Indian CEOs deliberately because that perception has come in now. Now you, you know, we went from having the horns to the halo now. <laughs> Neither is 100% true. The horns were not true either. They didn't exist. And the halo actually doesn't exist either but it's perceived. So that's why I want to keep going back. There is a shift that has happened in perception, which has created a tailwind that has led to the rise of the uh, Indians and sea levels. The last one I'll say, you know, and this will be a little controversial, maybe people don't like it. Look, there's bias and there's prejudice everywhere, right? It just is there. You know, you, um, I look at somebody who is, uh, um, uh, you know, Islamic background has a beard this long and comes in for an interview and wants to do a thing. I, I, I look at that person immediately in a certain way, you know, and maybe I'm biased, maybe I'm not biased, but, the, you know, just by looking at a person, it's there. Um, you know, you have um, a woman come in who's beautiful and smart and, you know, um, well-dressed and is interviewing for a job and you look at her a certain way and there's somebody else who comes in who's way overweight and, um, you know, looks like going through severe mental health issues. I mean, we are instantly judging people, whether we like it or not. And similarly with Indians, one of the things that happened was there was bias and there was stereotype typing that kind of held them back to some extent initially. And now as more and more people started getting into roles of positions of power, that's naturally also changing. You know, to give you an example, I have an Indian CTO. I did not hire him in the role because he's Indian. I have a, a CIO who's American who I've actually worked with across four companies and hired five times now. And, um, you know, I'm much closer to. But I, I, the fact that this guy's Indian didn't prevent me from hiring him because obviously I don't have a bias against Indians. And that was a factor as well, right? So a so couple of things around that. And then the last one, which I'll share is, you know, you already heard a lot about the culture, the values, you know, various things. There is a pattern of humility, which, you know, I'm not certain if it's all migrants or if it's specifically migrants from India, if it's part of the Indian culture, but at least in my experience, I find that Indians who have come to sea levels, and again, there are exceptions that prove the rule, tend to be less arrogant, less egotistic, less self-centered, and more humble and more empathetic than not, right? That's, and I think that's a, as the world changes and that becomes more valuable, right? As humility and empathy become more valuable than uh, charisma and personality and uh, just how you talk and how you articulate your vision, I think they are starting to win. Um, so I'll 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 wrap up with that in terms of initial comments and uh, uh, you know hopefully added something to the other perspectives that are there before. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, very interesting. Uh, you know, 
uh, I guess you know we will have uh, some time uh, after Nina's uh, remarks. We'll uh, jump back to a couple of points which we have raised in terms of perception and headwinds and in terms of halo and not horns. So <laughs> with this, I will request Nina to give her remarks. Nina, welcome. I can only say that after everything that I've heard this morning, it is really, I'm left almost speechless. So happily for me, I was in India in 2000, which is when a lot of the activity from India started to happen actually in a very profound way. And I, uh, I played a role in getting Society for Human Resource Management even into India by saying to my partners in SHRM, which I've been very active in for my whole career uh, since 1978, uh, I said, you know, you need to be here because the U.S. is going to need to understand how to tap into the Indian marketplace in the right way at some point. And that is going to, if you don't step in here, somebody else is going to. So uh, they actually allowed me the opportunity to open the first office for them outside the U.S. in, in India, which I did. Uh, and of course, it's still thriving. And now we do have a, a woman CEO who manages that whole part of the world for, for Society for Human Resource Management. I'm going to come at this from a little bit different perspective. <clears throat> Excuse me. My career is mostly HR. So, uh, Robbie, you really gave me a very good segue because I think that the world of work is profoundly changing. The boundaries of where you can get work done, and partially this is a gift from COVID because when everything could be virtual, it really changed the way that people looked at how do I get talent? Where do I find talent? How can I employ talent? It drove through technological advances. It drove the dropping of barriers, if you will, uh, to doing business on a global level. And therefore, the whole idea of the world of work and the competencies that it takes to be effective uh, have really started to shift. And you brought light from your perspective to that when you were talking about right now, the three top leadership goals on a global basis, or not goals, but competencies on a global basis are first of all, emotional intelligence, which is very important, understanding your surroundings, understanding what's happening with the people around you, um, understanding what it takes to manage people through complexity and to deal with complex problems and issues in a way that helps bring people along. And I'm going to say that if I, if I take any of the cultural aspects that I learned while I was in India, and I, I pretty much, um, became Indianized and still in heart, if you can see even what I'm wearing. Still at heart, I'm pretty pretty much Indianized still. Um, I kept saying while I lived there, I think in another life, I probably was Indian. But, but um, the idea of relationship being at the core of business even, and though it might be perceived as paternalism, it was really a caring of about the people in the workplace and what it what's important to them, what do they need? Um, and that that piece of relationship building, the Western work ethic is start with business. And one of the very first things I learned when I was in India, if I started any of my emails with a business line, I got completely ignored, uh, literally ignored. And I was in a pretty high level senior VP role on an integration mer merger and acquisition team. I, I would just not get a response at all. But if I started with something relationship building, like how are you today? What's the weather like in Chennai? Mumbai is beautiful. I would get right away a response back. So one of the things that's really in the Indian ethos as I've experienced it is starting with the relationship and not starting with work. And I think that helps the emotional intelligence piece of the activity begin to really develop. Then there's adaptability and agility that I think is, again, natural in the Indian uh, ethos. And when we talk about work ethic, it's that adaptability and agility in their work ethic that I think really drives maybe some different ways of approaching things rather than, I guess for me, the the uh, 
Protestant work ethic, if you want to call it that, or the Western work ethic is more a straight line. This is what we want to do. This is how we want to get there. And you just go this way because this is the only way that will work. But nothing really does work that way. And I think the recognition that you need to be aware of how flexible things have to be uh, in the workplace and how quickly you have to adapt to changes in the marketplace, in the economy, in the social, cultural aspects of what's happening in, in the communities in which you're working. I think that, again, is more innate in Indian leaders than it is in, in other leaders. And then strategic thinking. So, of course, being able to plan for the future and look ahead and anticipate um, and your discussion around the driven toward education and South from South India, you know, it really does. I mean, they 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 really do spend hours and hours and hours with their kids. And I think uh, Subramanian uh, made another point that they are willing to put all of their money, all of their money behind getting their kid educated, whether it's in the U.S. or Canada, whether they get loans, whether they don't get loans, they will ensure that either in the Indian marketplace or in the in the country destination of their choice, their children will have the education that they seek and want and in the field that they seek and want it to be, which, you know, in the Western work ethic, I will say, you know, I myself said to my own kids, I can pay for college for one year for you guys. I have two kids. They're uh, 11 months apart. You're going to be in college at the same time. I can't support both of you. Do well in high school. I told them this when they were freshmen and sophomores, right? You do well in high school, get yourself a scholarship, and I want to support you in whatever you want to do as an adult, but I can't pay for it, right? You've got to figure it out. I can give you each one year. Um, and they both went off and did their own thing, but that would never happen <laughs> in an Indian family anywhere in the world, I don't think. Um, and I don't think I'm unique as a, a, you know, a Western parent of children either, because I think that our... Um, focus on education is very different as you shared earlier. So those three competencies, strategic thinking, adaptability and agility, and emotional intelligence, I think are key leadership skills that are needed today because of the changing world of work, period. And as the, as the world of work continues to grow and the barriers for a business globally are shifting and we can hire people from anywhere and it's much easier to outsource and there's a lot of capability of places to outsource too. I think those uh, innate skills and competencies in Indian leaders are going to continue whether they're political, whether they're educational and you're seeing more and more deans and in educational institutions across the US of Indian origin as well. Um, so I think they're going to continue to be recognized because they are innate. They don't have to be learned. Um, and of course, nothing is ever 100%. And I hate talking in generalities, but for the most part, uh, I think those are innate um, competencies that Indian leaders are able to exhibit in the workplace. And one last thought to this is that I, I don't think that that's going to get lost in American culture because everywhere I've lived in the U.S. and I've lived in many states and many places and many cities where there is a strong Indian uh, base of people, uh, there is a strong Indian culture as well that shows itself. It shows itself on all the Indian holidays, on all of the um, events that happen, um, the weddings that get held in the cities that are beautiful and magnificent just because of the a range of color and the gorgeous saris and everything that come to town for the for the wedding. So I don't I don't see that cultural ethos being dampened at all over time. It will I think become more and more evident and more and more um, seen as a benefit by Indians who are privileged to be a part of it. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for the opportunity to share my humble thoughts. And I am just blown away by the amazing information that was shared today. And again, feeling very privileged that I got, actually was in India from 2000 till 2010. So both the dates that uh, uh, Dr. Kapoor talked about in terms of shifts that happened, I got to witness on the ground in India 
And it is really the whole reason that I became a, a, an Indiophile, if you want to call it that, uh, because I could see what was happening and see the value that India was going to bring to the globe. Great, great, wonderful. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Ravi. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, we uh, we really appreciate your participation. And let me uh, start. And we have Dr. Shet also, and John has also joined. And Jim, uh, please uh, feel free to join in this Q and A. And if you can uh, bring a question from the audience you have been receiving, that will be helpful. Uh, uh, Jim, while you prepare to do that, let me uh, start by asking one thing. Uh, uh, to three of you, uh, actually four of you, John also. Uh, what do you see uh, the future forward trend in this part? And the reason is that, you know, there are very few large Indian companies who have uh, uh, operations of the magnitude which American companies have in India now. And we have talked about it, you know, the likes of Oracle and IBM and uh, Intel and, you know, the, uh, diff uh, you know, the, the research centers, which are coming thousand G I had honor of visiting when it got Jack Welch center in Bangalore started with 5,000 plus. We don't have that kind of operations of any Indian companies here, except Maybe, you know, uh, in manufacturing sector, let's say we have Novalis or we have uh, Tata's and Infosys and all. Mm. So, you know, it is very important for us to understand that uh, two third of the numbers of uh, graduates from top institutions, John, were still working in India, are still working in India. OK. Mm -hmm. yes. And, you know, uh, so mm -hmm. I would like to flip the coin and say that. What does Indian CEO brings to a global corporation versus what does an Indian C-level executive brings to an Indian corporation in terms of their own global mobilization? I can, you know, take maybe a first pass at it. Look, I, I think honestly, the Thank Indian you. market, if you think about the growth rates relative to the rest of the world, um, most Indian CEOs in India that I talk to I think unfortunately are uh, uh, getting fat, dumb and happy because they are fishing in a pond which has a lot of fish right now and there's a lot of funding that's uh, easily happening. So the the drive that I see here, even in the US to go international, right? And expand into other geographies. Uh, I certainly see it in companies in uh, uh, East Asia. I see it in companies in other parts of the world, Europe for sure. Um, I'm seeing less of it in India. And I think there's a danger that they may become more Japan or Brazil-like. Both countries mm -hmm. suffer from being insular in terms of the business environment because they both have very nice markets internally. Right? And China is the third, you know, kind of another one. Oh, Ravi, I would agree with you on that front that there mm -hmm. is such a huge market in India that's mm -hmm. that's continuing to grow. And you know, when I was living there, it was second first, second, and third tier cities that we were looking at. And now I'm imagining that it's fourth, fifth, and sixth tier cities that are actually beginning to make a rise in with the onset of IIs expanding, ITs and uh, IMs expanding their reach across the across the whole country. Um, I think, you know, significant changes. And also during COVID, from some of the people that I know in India, they went back to their villages because they weren't able to continue to live in the major metros. And when they got back to their villages, they started entrepreneurial efforts in their village with their yeah. with their neighbors. I think this is going to change that landscape and keep that internal growth really fostering. So um, <clears throat> there may be that trend to really focus inward for a while to help India. You know, one of the things I've always admired about India is slow and steady. So when I was there from 2000 till 2010, the GDP was projected to grow at like 4% a year, and it did. And in that meantime, China was like doing, you know, 12%, 15%, 30%. Uh, but India was just slow and steady, slow and steady, slow and steady, slow and steady, and kept moving forward. I think now it's at a point where it could go to double, di double digits quickly if it really does focus internally as much as it needs to um, and uses the two thirds talent that stays there from 
uh, the university levels across the country to actually um, shove entrepreneurship forward and to uh, uh, Mr. Shankar's uh, contributions to the conversation really push forward that entrepreneurial spirit. I actually have two entrepreneurs that I'm very close to that started their businesses in my living room when I lived in Mumbai. And they're both doing very good businesses right now and uh, both operating on a more global scale. We started out locally in India and servicing specific markets in India. They both are in HR related fields and that's how I came to know them. But one is CN Recruit, which is a, a executive uh, search firm. And the other one is Husis Consulting, which just became a part of People of People 2.0 as a BPO back office for small and medium sized businesses. Um, and those entrepreneurs worked hard, worked very hard and are still working very hard to hold on to market share. Um, so I, I think we're gonna see more of an internal need to pay attention internally to what's going on in India and to help develop those fourth, fifth and sixth tier cities to their full potential. And it might for a little while uh, mitigate some of the advancement outside of India, but I think overall it will be very good for India. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks Nina. So John, um, question to you. Were you going to ask a question or can I ask you a question? No, I was going to try and answer your question, but okay. I wanted to mention first because I couldn't remember it, uh, uh, Jag's book is India's Road to Transformation, Why Leadership Matters. Uh, and I highly recommend it, what, the plug I wanted to put in and forgot. Uh, I want to say that uh, we are at a critical juncture in many ways. If you look at the underlying issues that are going on, that are a part of and parcel of the current presidential election, the notion of globalization, deglobalization, uh, reducing mobility, uh, is there is a sharp divide if uh, not necessarily in the rhetoric or the speech that are made for the general public but if you look at the underlying plans so uh, and this goes for india india has changed and transformed itself under modi and prior prime ministers <clears throat> but it would be nice to see more sea levels coming from a, a non-india origin in india itself as an indication precisely of joining full-fledged, full-speed, this internationalization that is now under really a review. Because if you look at the trade index, it's actually going down, even though it's it's huge, given the size of the world economy. So these are just the observations I wanted to make. And of course, Nina is the exception, because she lived in India as an executive for 10 years. So maybe she is actually proving me wrong. But uh, I don't see very many uh, Japanese, well, a few Japanese, but they, they have a very hard time dealing with India uh, in managerial positions. Okay, that's the, the point I wanted to, to raise here. Right. This sort of return to some form of uh, graduated protectionist type thinking. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, Dr. Shade. Indian multinationals are clearly going global, but mostly through acquisition. If you look at Tata's acquisition of Tata Motors, uh, buying out Jaguar and Land Rover, Techly T, which is a really big brand, uh, you see that same thing in the Birla Group. You see in Reliance you now the same tendency. It's mostly through acquisition. And one of the key constraints has been cost of capital. So the question is, which capital will be, is it the domestic stock market capital that you can use to expand globally, or is it a private equity, for example? More and more private equity, surprisingly coming from Western world, comes to India and funds Indian enterprises to go global. Very fascinating scenario. And that money is pretty large. It's about 60 to $65 billion annually coming through, which is a money flow behind the scenes. So I will expect more applications. We don't see as much in America yet, but for example, in London, many, many companies are owned by Indian enterprises. Mm -hmm. uh, Lakshmi Mittal, of course, is the car seller, Mittal, you know, steel company, which is very large. The Zabirla Group is second largest in the world in uh, uh, flat 
aluminum, for example, yeah. my entire group is like number two in tractor business. I can go and give you examples. So Indian multinationals are growing. Mm -hmm. okay. What I see yeah. more interesting is the following. India is, whether the government likes it or not, is going to become the service capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And India has to nurture that idea rather than saying we'll focus on the forecast is that most of the technology companies, rather than have a contract with services companies like TCS, Wipro, Infosys, etc., will have their own employees in India. Mm -hmm. Already it is true for Accenture, the largest IT services company in India, employees of employees. IBM had the same vision 10 years ago. Some of IBM has not been able to do that very well. India was the third largest employment base after America, Japan, and India. We wanted to plan India becoming second at least, but clearly Microsoft is gunning the way to get their own employment base in India. So most of the employment in India will come from foreign multinationals, especially in the services. There are many, many possibilities that are happening. In India, generally, the view of the government is that India needs to get globally. So they will encourage this movement rather than discourage it, including and enabling that the government diplomatic to diplomatic alignment is made as French always do very well, where the French president goes out and makes a sale. So we have done very well. I think Indian government is learning that their embassies are not just passports and peace management, but they are the brand ambassadors, investment attractiveness of Indian companies investing abroad and foreign companies investing in India. I see very large scale talent based. Again, just to give an example, the largest accounting firm in India is Austin. In one location in Hyderabad alone, there are 50,000 employees. This is a small Bartley boy. More right. than 10 years ago, they went there, which is fascinating. So, so to me, India will get globally integrated and will go from a low wage economy to more and more high wage economy in everything it does, which is also the policy of the government. I'll stop here. I can go on giving examples. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shet. Uh, we are uh, uh, we are at a time where we need to unfortunately close this session. And before closing, I want to thank all the speakers who are present here in the session: Nina, Ravi, Dr. Shet, John, Jim. And also like to inform you about our next program. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, it's fine, Ani. Yeah, okay, great. So, you know, we invite all of you to please stay tuned for our next program, which is on September 20th, again, virtually being presented. Uh, and it is titled as Ways to Become uh, AI Superpower. AI is in fashion nowadays. Uh, case of China, America, and India. And uh, we will send you more information in a day or two about the program. Also, I would like to share with you uh, mm -hmm. that uh, our 15th annual USA-India Business Summit and 30th Georgia Tech Global Business Forum is scheduled to uh, take place on uh, November 20th in person in uh, Historic Academy of Medicine, Georgia Tech. So please stay tuned. Uh, appreciate your help and support for today's program and looking forward to staying in touch. Have a good afternoon and a nice weekend. Thank you all. Signing off. Thank you. Thank you Cheers. So much. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jim. Bye.